Speaker. Mr Speaker, I move that this debate be now adjourned. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion will say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Order. The, let the me just... Order. Well, point of order. The, the point of order, order is pretty Mr Speaker. I, I seek leave for the House to rise upon the conclusion of uh, Ms Fitzsimons' speech. It's likely to go beyond six o'clock, and I think that uh, uh, the House could, could extend its sitting. Uh, by leave on this occasion. Leave is sought for that purpose. Any objection? Leave was. Leave. Yes. Yeah, I think. I think. Um, I think that is the. That's very good. Yeah. Leave is sought that uh, uh, to suspend suspend for the dinner hour the completion of the uh, uh, the valedictory speech of Jeanette Fitzsimons. Is there any objection to that course of action? There is no objection. But this debate, the debate that uh, the House just uh, voted upon, is adjourned and set down for resumption next sitting day. In accordance with the determination of the Business Committee, I call Jeanette Fitzsimons to make her valedictory statement. Mr Speaker, can I thank um, the Honourable Bill English for his kind words a moment ago and the House for agreeing to postpone dinner. Unfortunately, as I didn't know the House was going to do that, I'm afraid I won't be speaking more than a minute or so past six. So you can rest assured that dinner will still occur at a reasonable time. <clears throat> it's been 13 years, Mr Speaker, since I had the great privilege of giving the first Green speech in the New Zealand Parliament. I never set out to be an MP or a Green Party leader. I was pushed into it under that maxim of John Lennon's that life is what happens to you while you're making other plans. I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up and I'm not sure I found the answer yet. I was proud to be a member of an MMP parliament with its much greater representation of women, Maori and ethnic communities. I am still proud to have led the party that pioneered several new constitutional relationships with successive governments and developed processes for the negotiations between parties which now ensure that governments have to think twice about policies and earn genuine majorities before they pass them. It's not the only change for the better that MMP has made and I've been trying to think if there are any others from that 96 intake here tonight who experienced the bizarre orientation session where we were taught by parliamentary service how to pack a suitcase. <laughs> this is the right size to fit in the overhead rack and it has compartments to put our carefully ironed shirts on one side with pockets for the ties and the socks on the other. <laughs> the large new intake of women fell about laughing and I suspect it was the last year that that module was taught. It was the year that Winston Peters had kept the country waiting for 10 weeks before deciding which party to support, so there was no time for maiden speeches before Christmas. By the time February came, I was so impatient to get started that on my first day I leapt to my feet and blurted, Supplementary Speaker, Mr Question. <laughs> speaker Doug Kidd was kind enough not to laugh. There was also no time to wait for the niceties of a maiden speech before moving a resolution, supported 111 to 9, expressing the concern of the House about the nuclear waste ship that was passing through the Tasman Sea on that very day. In that first speech, I spoke of the birth of the Green Movement internationally 25 years earlier and of the vision of the first Values Party manifesto in 1972, heralding much which has since come to pass. Since that speech, the Greens have become a parliamentary party in our own right, built our representation to nine MPs, introduced and passed six members' bills with another currently in select committee and an eighth awaiting its first reading. We've established the tradition that support parties under MMP can expect to negotiate budget initiatives that advance their policies, and I was proud to pioneer those negotiations. Rather than threatening to withhold support, we expected and got recognition in here that relationships in here have to be reciprocal and based on trust. There are many laws that passed only because of our support, laws that are different because of our amendments, 
and potential laws that never made it because of our opposition. But most of all, the role of the Greens has been to set the agenda, to raise issues that had never been raised in this House before. In 1996, many throughout the world were talking about climate change, sustainable energy policies, toxic chemicals, human rights, genetic engineering, and the failure of our current ways of measuring economic success. But this Parliament mostly was not. Those are the issues that I and my colleagues have brought here and which are becoming mainstream. The breathing space we created on genetic engineering with the Royal Commission and Moratorium, while it did not result in the law becoming precautionary enough, did prevent the release of crops that could never have been contained and which were imminent in 1999. Transport policy refocused somewhat on public transport, cycling, walking and rail. And even the current fixation on new roads has been unable to stop the momentum of the electrification of Auckland's rail system. The Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act, my first member's bill, has made energy standards part of mainstream energy policy, saving millions for consumers. Communities fighting major environmental battles are now better resourced with legal aid at the Environment Court and the resourcing of local conservation initiatives. Yet I have to say with great sadness that the big picture has not changed all that much. This place on which we pin such hopes as the pinnacle of democracy has proved itself incapable of responding to the crises that threaten to overwhelm us. As an institution, it is asleep, often in denial, often preoccupied with trivia. When my grandchildren, Jasper and Isabella, here in the gallery today, are struggling to bring up their children in 30 years' time, amid the storms and the instability of a changing climate, with little oil left and that being unaffordable, what will they think of us at the turn of the millennium? What will they think of a parliament more preoccupied with its own privileges than with the good of humanity? A parliament that spent far more passion and energy on where Bill English parks his car than on where we will get the oil to run it, or on measures to reduce climate emissions, the pollution of our waterways, the protection of our unique ecosystems and species from extinction. What will they think of governments who had all the information presented to them who could not claim to know, but who chose to do nothing. I have sat here for 13 years weeping at the tragedy of so many people wasting the precious gift of life chasing the mirage of a bigger GDP. What is stopping us as a species, and particularly as a parliament, from seeing the truth that climate change, which has now entered public consciousness, is only a symptom of a much greater issue? The planet is full. Its capacity to absorb our wastes and generate our resources is already overstretched. And even mining the last national park and Antarctica and damming or draining the last river will not allow us to continue using even more. Our ancestors could be forgiven for thinking the planet was infinite, unmeasurable and obviously flat. Their world was circumscribed by what could be walked or ridden or sailed. Even when it was proved to be round, it was still immense, and round the world in 80 days was an amazing feat. Reducing 80 days to two still didn't change the deep-seated certainty that there can be no limits. Despite the images from space, economics still takes it as a given that we live in an infinitely elastic universe. For 30 years, there have been many studies of how economic growth does not improve human well-being, even for the poorest. But the poor have always been an excuse for policies designed mainly to benefit the rich. The central message I came here with 13 years ago is that we need to find better ways of measuring our economic success, and that the aim should be a better economy, not just a bigger one. An economy based on respect for people and for nature, not on dog-eats-dog -dog competitiveness. The futility of our current measures is shown by the Brash report on closing the income gap with Australia. Australia has bigger houses, so more housework. More cars per person, 
so high are greenhouse gases, more than one cell phone each, and they 